It's a great pleasure to be able to address you this morning. It would be a much greater pleasure could I be here in person and interact and be part of this conference, and I apologize for that. But unfortunately, it was not possible. I want to start by giving you the perspective that colleagues and I developed when I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. These were the sort of figures that gave rise to the concern of the Commission. This shows life expectancy for men in selected countries. And you can see that life expectancy in Lesotho is just above 40. In Iceland, it's 80. Were I to show you women, you would see that life expectancy for women in Zimbabwe is 42. For women in Japan, it's 86. A 44-year difference in life expectancy across the world. And for men, a nearly 40-year difference. The starting point for the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and indeed for my concerns with global health, is that there's no good biological reason why there should be a spread of 40 years in life expectancy across the world. It arises because of our social and economic arrangements. When we published the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I was concerned to make clear that health inequalities weren't just a matter for people in poor countries and those of us in rich countries had good health, but indeed the inequalities in health in rich countries overlapped with those in middle and low income countries. And what I've just added to this slide is life expectancy for men in Glasgow. In the poorest part of Glasgow, men have a life expectancy of 54, in the richest part, 82. A 28 year difference of life expectancy over a distance of about 11 kilometers in one Scottish city. As you can see, the average life expectancy in India is 62, eight years longer than for the poorest people of Glasgow. In India, 75% of the population lives on $2 a day or less. And no one in Glasgow lives on $2 a day or less. In Glasgow, they have clean water. The food is not contaminated biologically. They have shelter. They don't die of communicable disease. They die of heart disease and cancer and violent deaths and other alcohol-associated deaths. They die, in other words, of the same sets of causes that we die from in the rest of the United Kingdom, but at a much faster rate. And so important is the operation of the social determinants of health that in the poorest part of Glasgow, life expectancy is eight years shorter than the average in India. Global inequalities are a problem for all of us, whether in high-income countries, middle-income countries, or low-income countries. And we have to look at the inequalities within and the inequalities between countries. The fact that I say there's no good biological reason why we should have this should actually give some grounds for optimism. And we can see that rates can change rather rapidly. Look at these figures, for example. If we were having the discussion in the 1950s or 1960s about global differences in health, we might say that Vietnam and Zambia were equally miserable cases. Life expectancy was low. It was poverty. We might say, what could you do about it? But look what happened. In Zambia, life expectancy in the 70s and 80s plateaued and then declined. Whereas in Vietnam, it took off and continued to increase. So it's right up there now with life expectancy not greatly different from those among the richer countries. Look at Costa Rica. Costa Rica was always a famous example 
of a relatively poor country with remarkably good health despite relatively low income. And that good health has continued to improve year on year. So now life expectancy in Costa Rica is rather similar to life expectancy in the United Kingdom, despite national income in Costa Rica being about one third of that in the UK at purchasing power parities. So these global differences in health can change very rapidly. I said when talking about Glasgow that we have to think about poverty in a different way because no one in Glasgow is poor in the sense of living on two dollars a day or less. This makes the point in a different way. We're not dealing only with absolute destitution but health follows a social gradient. This graph shows under five mortality by quintiles, 20% of wealth. What you can see, look at Uganda, for example, the top quintile, the top 20% of wealth have the lowest under five mortality. The second from the top have somewhat higher, third somewhat higher, all the way down, so the bottom 20% has the highest under five mortality. Now people have put to me, in a poor country like Uganda, surely we need to focus on the poorest of the poor. But I say, look at the middle quintile, 160 per thousand live births. In fact, under five mortality in the middle quintile is higher than in the bottom quintile in India. And in India, why would you want to focus only on the bottom? People second from the top have unacceptably high under five mortality, and it's higher than those at the top. We need to look at the whole spectrum, the social gradient in health, and in this case, under five mortality. And the implications of looking at the gradient and not focusing only on the poorest of the poor is the gradient demands that we take action across the whole of society as distinct from targeting the poor. Because, in fact, we would want Morocco, Peru, Turkmenistan, all of these countries, everybody to have the good health of those at the top. And, in fact, when we look at the rates for those at the top, we might say, why shouldn't they have the under five mortality of three per thousand live births that we see in Iceland? So we need to deal with the gradient and that implies dealing with the whole of society. And that gradient is similar in the United Kingdom. As I'll tell you in a moment, I conducted a review of health inequalities at the request of the British government of what we could do in England. And these data come from England. Each dot on the graph, look at the top, dot, the top graph first, each dot on the graph is a small area of the country classified by degree of neighborhood income deprivation. And the top graph is life expectancy. And what you see is the graded relation between income deprivation and life expectancy. Those near the top at the right-hand end are the least deprived, the most affluent. Those near the top have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. Those in the middle have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. And those near the bottom shorter than those near the middle, but longer than those at the very bottom. If we compare the fifth centile of the distribution with the 95th centile, the gap is seven years, but it's a graded relation. Now look at the graph in dark green, the one underneath. This is disability-free life expectancy. The gap between the fifth and the 95th centile is now not seven years, but 17 years. And so you see it's a steeper gradient. And what it implies that people at the top 
live about 12 years of their lives on average with disability. Those at the bottom live about 20 years of their lives on average with disability. Now I've been pushed to make the economic case for taking action on health inequalities. And my argument is that we should take action on health inequalities because it's a matter of social justice. In other words, it's a moral case, not an economic case. But in making the economic case, in addition to the moral case, look at the horizontal green line. The previous government in Britain had a policy to advance retirement age to 68 by 2046. And that's the top of that horizontal green line. Were that 68 retirement age to be enforced today, what you can see is that three quarters of the population do not have disability-free life expectancy as long as 68. Now the policy of advancing retirement age is being done for solid economic reasons. That policy won't work unless we take action on the social gradient in disability-free life expectancy. The Commission on Social De Determinants of Health published its report in August 2008, and we called the report Closing the Gap in a Generation. This was not a prediction. I've shown you 40-year differences in life expectancy. We weren't predicting that the gap would close in a generation. But it was a statement that we had the knowledge, we had the means to make an enormous difference to the gap, the health gap, in one generation. The question is, did we have the will? And we said, as I said a moment ago, that taking action was a matter of social justice. And we put at the heart of what we were trying to achieve empowerment, which we thought of as material, psychosocial, and political. And we had three principles of action. The first was to take action on the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. The second was to address the structural drivers of those conditions at global, national, and local level. And the third was the importance of monitoring, training, and research. And in the conditions of daily life, we had recommendations on early child development and education, healthy places, fair employment, social protection, and universal health care. And in the structural drivers, I put in red here health equity in all policies, that all policies should be evaluated for their impact on health equity. Good global governance, gender equity, political empowerment, market responsibility, and fair financing. I was in Norway at a meeting last year, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Norway said, I am a health minister. Every minister is a health minister because what we do in our day job has important impact on health. And I would say every sector is a health sector because what happens in education, in environment, in early child development, in employment, in work and pensions, all affect health. The Global Commission was, as its name suggests, global. We were concerned with Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, South Asia, North America, Europe, etc. How could you get a set of recommendations that would apply equally to all these different settings? We said it was vital that our recommendations be translated into national contexts. In Britain, I was invited by the government to conduct a review of health inequalities in the light of the report of the Global Commission to say, what could we do? We published that review in February this year. 
and I called it Fair Society, Healthy Lives. It was a statement that if genuinely we put fairness at the heart of all decision making, then health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. The phrase on the left there was because I've been asked many times, where's personal responsibility in all this? It's all very well to talk about social determinants of health, but what about individuals taking responsibility for their own health? And my response is personal responsibility is key. It's right at the center. But we have to create the conditions for people to take control of their own lives. This doesn't just come taking personal responsibility for your health is absolutely fine and is what we should be aiming at, but people can't take responsibility if they don't have clean water, if they don't have shelter, if they don't have access to nutritious food, if they don't have education or jobs. So we need to create the conditions for people to have control over their lives. We had two clear goals in the English Review to reduce health inequalities and improve health for all. And we said the way to do that is to create an enabling society that maximizes individual and community potential and ensures social justice, health and sustainability are at the heart of all policies. And we had six domains of recommendations, early childhood, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. The fourth one was establishing a minimum income for healthy living. People have enough to lead a healthy life. The fifth was creating and developing healthy and sustainable places for, for which, in which to live. And it's bringing the social determinants of health, health and equalities agenda together with the climate change environmental agenda. And the sixth was focusing more on public health and prevention. Let me show you just one example of the evidence related to early childhood. These are data from the 1970 birth cohort in England. Children are followed from 22 months of age to 10 years of age. And these are scores, relative scores, of cognitive development. Now look at the 22 months of age. Look at children who at 22 months were ranked in the 10th centile, down near the bottom there. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. There's some regression to the mean, but that needn't detain us for the moment. So by 10 years of age, they still have low rankings on cognitive development. If they started off at the 10th centile, that is low, but grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. Now look at the ones at the top at 22 months who are in the 90th centile. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, their relative ranking declines. But if they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high. Now assume, just for the moment, that all the differences in cognitive development at 22 months were biologically determined. Genes, nutrition in pregnancy, birth trauma, and so on. But that the influences associated with the socioeconomic status of the family were social. What you can see is that the social trumps the biological. A more important determinant is not where you started 22 months, but the family in which you grew up. Now, of course, not all the differences at 22 months are biological. They do relate to the quality of early nurturing. Nutrient in pregnancy is socially determined. But you can see quite how powerful the operation of the social environment is. Now, why am I showing you this when we're talking about health inequalities? Because 
what happens in early childhood in terms of cognitive and linguistic development, social and emotional development, as well as physical development, have a powerful influence on what happens in the school system, what happens when you leave school and enter the labor market, where you live, your income, and hence on health. This life course perspective shows that what happens in early childhood has a profound influence throughout life on health and the distribution of health, health inequalities. So we stressed equality and equity in all policies and the importance of evidence on effective delivery systems. Let's return to the global context. We have an economic crisis. A study of a number of low-income countries looked at the fiscal hole, essentially the debt as a percent of GDP. And what you can see, Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa, countries where the IMF has programs, countries where they don't, East Asia and the Pacific, South Africa, Europe and Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa, in these low-income countries, the enormous fiscal hole that has been made worse by the economic crisis. And what will that do to these 28 low-income countries where we had comparable data? 2008-9, there will be a decline in expenditure on social protection, a decline in expenditure on education, 2009-10, a decline in expenditure on health and on infrastructure, as well as on social protection. A global economic crisis that began in the boardrooms of the City of London and Wall Street is having profound effect on social spending in low-income countries, with potentially a very bad effect on health inequalities. What this graph shows us is overseas development assistance put in the, contact, on the, in the context of the amount of money countries pay back as interest on debts, debt servicing. So look first at Sub-Saharan Africa, and we've got a number of years here. The amount of money that comes in in development assistance receipts is, of course, positive. That's aid going to the country. And more money goes in in aid than comes out in debt service outflows. That's sub-Saharan Africa. Look at South Asia. You can see the amount of money going in, relatively modest. The amount of money coming out in debt servicing is much greater than the amount of money going in. Middle East and North Africa, look how much comes out. Latin America, East Asia and the Pacific, these are cash cows for the rich world. When we published the Commission report, we drew attention to the fact that in the early 90s, about 50 or $60 billion a year flowed from the rich countries to the poor countries. 10 years later, $500 billion a year, a year was coming out of the poor countries into the rich countries in debt servicing. The global context is very much affecting how countries can take action on reducing inequalities in health and improving health for everybody. Let me focus now particularly on women. And I want to touch here on education of women, vital for economic and social development and vital for the development of good health. This graph plots female net primary school employment rate on the x-axis and the probability of dying by age five on the y-axis. 
And what you can see is a very strong relation. The higher the female education, the lower the under five mortality. One of the best interventions that you can do to reduce under five mortality is educate women. And you can see that was at a country level. Now this is looking both within and between countries. Each of these graphs, so for example, look at the right hand end, Mozambique. It's got infant mortality and the top is the infant mortality in children born to women who do not have secondary education. And the bottom is the infant mortality born in children born to women who do have secondary education. Enormous difference. And you can see in each of these countries the big difference, much lower infant mortality in mothers who have secondary education. So there are huge between country differences and huge within country differences. And you can see that some of the within country differences are as large as the between country differences. Female education, not just primary education, which the previous slide showed, but secondary education, as this one shows, could make an enormous difference to child health. <coughs> and in the slide I showed you from the English data, not just to child survival, but to cognitive and linguistic development. I said in recommendation number five from the English Review, we needed to put health in the context of climate change sustainability. And climate change adds urgency to take action on social determinants of health. By 2030, the world's population will have risen from 6 billion to 8 billion. Demand for food will increase by 50%. Demand for water will rise by 30%. Demand for energy will increase by 50%. We already have evidence that climate change is making worse health inequalities. We need to make sure that our steps at mitigation and adaptation don't actually also make health inequalities worse. We need to have regard to the equity impact of the important steps we take for climate change. And we can see these are CO2 emissions per capita among China, India and Japan. And you can see the big rises the different scale for Japan and China, but you can see the big rises. It's not clear that the negotiations in Copenhagen actually had equity in mind, and perhaps that's why they failed, because the West was on a collision course with the developing nations. You're discussing the Millennium Development Goals. The been global progress towards the MDG target of improved drinking water. Very welcome. But look at the social gradient in disparities in improved drinking water sources in sub-Saharan Africa. In the richest quintile, 35% have water piped on premises. 51% have other improved sources of water. But those numbers go down, those percentages go down as you go down the social scale. So by the time you're in the poorest quintile, quintile none has piped water on premises and only 36% access to other improved sources. One of the problems with the MDGs is they've not really looked at distributions within countries. Absolutely vital. And part of the issue is what we're seeing here, deaths due to diarrhea in low and middle income countries. The Commission on Social Determinants of Health paid a lot of attention to urban settings. 
by 2005, we'd passed a watershed. 51% of, we were nearly passing the watershed, 51% of the global population were in rural areas. I think it was two years later that it was now a majority in urban areas. And we see examples here from a middle-income country of the social gradient in urban areas that are not unique to rich countries. This is cardiovascular deaths of people aged 45 to 64 in Porto Alegre in Brazil, where neighborhoods were classified according to the socioeconomic level. So you can see high, medium, high, medium, low, and low, the lower the socioeconomic level of the neighborhood, the higher the death rate from cardiovascular disease, and it's a social gradient. In fact, 45% of all premature cardiovascular deaths could be attributed to having a social position below the very top. Is anyone taking notice of these analyses and recommendations? Well, the answer is, yeah, I think they are a bit. For example, at the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, in his opening address in 2009 said, we now know that most of the inequities in health we see are avoidable and they arise because of the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And that's a direct quote from the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. I think there are encouraging signs that some countries, other global fora, are taking this on board. And I come back to where I began. There may be good economic reasons for doing what we're doing. But if we really want to achieve global health equity, we all have to work towards a world where social justice is taken seriously.